In the book, The Poetics of Biblical Narrative, Mayor Sternberg has a chapter on gaps in stories. He says that to understand a literary work, we have to answer in the course of reading a series of such questions as, what is happening or has happened and why? What connects the present event or situation to what went before? And how do both relate to what will probably come after? What are the features, motives, or designs of this or that character? How does he view his fellow characters? And what norms govern the existence and conduct of all? And it is in answering these questions, these gaps, that we will make sense of the work. But the problem is that few of the answers to these questions have been explicitly provided in the text from the viewpoint of what is directly given in the language. The literary work consists of bits and fragments to be linked together and pieced together in the process of reading. It establishes a system of gaps that must be filled in. Gaps are especially important in a film that deals with hiddenness. So let's look at Terrence Malick's film, A Hidden Life, and fill in some gaps. On the surface, A Hidden Life is about an Austrian farmer, Franz Jägerstädter, his wife and three daughters during World War II. The film follows the struggle of the family as Franz becomes a conscientious objector who is jailed and then executed. The title of the film is taken from George Eliot's novel Middlemarch. The quote in full reads, that the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. The most obvious meaning of the film is that the hidden life upon which the good of the world is dependent is Franz and his family. But how Malik directs this hidden life reveals the depth of his art and the art of Franz's life. There are many hidden things in this film. Perhaps most strikingly, World War II itself is hidden. While we see some historical footage of Hitler, the SS, some fire, Malik chose to show nothing of the war proper, no warfare, no fighting. The most obvious and popular aspects of war he has hidden from us. He has also hidden heads, yes, literal heads. In a strange compositional decision, Malik crops many heads out of the frame, hiding heads. Malik will also hide other things that we would expect to see. He often hides the priest and the bishop in the sanctuary of churches. While there are many scenes in the church and sanctuary, we rarely see the priest in the church. He's most often outside. In the jail, the guard will say that no one knows what goes on behind these walls. And at the end of the movie, while it is implied that Franz is beheaded, that is hidden from us too. Malik intentionally hid and showed specific things because the main message of the film is that some of the most important things are hidden and we ought to attend to those things. But if the most important things are hidden, then we need a guide to help us see them. Malik hides things, even things that we expect to see in order to show us the things that we ought to see. By withholding the war from us, Malik is guiding our attention to the good that we ought to be seeing, a farmer and his family. But what about those hidden heads? Malik hides heads from us out of the necessity of the height of the camera. Often, if not most of the time, the average height of the camera is not at the eye level of an adult, but a child. The implied viewer of the film is a child. And this is a brilliant decision, because some things are naturally hidden from a child. But also, as Jesus taught us, some things are more easily seen by children. Jesus says that we must become like a child, and Malik films in a way to help us in that becoming. If Malik wants us to look away from the obvious things and look at the hidden things, that is Franz and his family, what are we supposed to see in them? What particularly about his life ought we to notice? We'll look at four aspects of the character of the hidden life. We see many religious things, 
clergy, prayers, images, feasts, processionals, and churches. And while this may give the feeling of Christian piety and devotion, Malik will hide some things in order to direct our attention to more important things, things that are often hidden in the world. In multiple scenes, Franz is shown working in the church, attending to the graveyard and helping in renewing the artwork on the walls. While the priest conducts a processional and the churches are ornate, Franz is the only one literally building the church, upkeeping it. Interestingly, we most often see the priest outside the church. And like Franz's later conscientious objection, he will build the church almost entirely alone, without priest or friend, silently building and beautifying the church by his witness. From high to low, the art on the walls of the church to the grass in the graveyard, from his idyllic home high in the mountains to the bottom of the jail, kissing the shoes of a guard. Hitler has become the paradigm of evil, to the point of cliché or abstraction. And the danger of evil becoming abstract is that it ceases to be applicable and accosting. We don't fight against a concept, we fight against men. Malik reifies the evil of Hitler by transposing it or revealing its origin in ordinary life with ordinary people. The evil is, in the description of Hannah Arendt, banal. World War II told through a town. Malik tells the tale of World War II through a town. All the people in the town are angry at Franz and his wife. They spit at his wife, yell, steal from her garden. The only fighting we see in a film about World War II is between Franz and friends. With people like Hitler who have become highly abstract, often their path to evil is ignored in the light of the weight of their evil. Malik shows us that Hitler came to be not by the sheer will of an individual, but by a thousand hidden looks and words spoken against a neighbor. The theater of war is on the soil, across rivers and ravines, fields and farms. And while we see all these places, Malik shows us a different interaction with creation. While the world's war was destroying the earth, a hidden family was cultivating it, making it fruitful, running over it, not to end life, but to embrace it, playing on it, loving on it. In a delightful irony, the family will play fight, chase, hide, throw water, not fire, carry sleeping children, not dead men. They enact the actions of war as a parody of war, a pantomime of fighting that produces life and love and does not destroy it. The only death that happens takes place in a building, a building of a more inhumane and brutalist aesthetic. Malik locates death away from creation in a building as if to say that the nature of the Nazi is unnatural, unable to cope and live peaceably and skillfully in creation. Their actions are anti-nature, so much so that it would be improper to act in such ways in the world, so they must construct another building, another world in which to act. Malik hides war as well as death. We never see death. We never actually see Franz die. He is brought to the guillotine and then the camera cuts. And as with all the other hiding, Malik hides to reveal something else. And what Malik wants us to give attention to instead is what follows or what replaces the time that would have been taken up with watching a beheading. Instead of a beheading, we see farming, a wedding, water to a child, images that are the quintessence of life, actions that are fecund, producing food and children. Malik is saying that while we could be attending to the grotesque, the end of life, 
At that same moment, we could instead attend to the good and the beautiful beginnings of life. Malik's film is a lesson in attention. Often what is most obvious is not what we ought to look at, and what is hidden holds the goodness. In turn, like Malik, we need to hide things and pay attention to the places where God is sowing life and liveliness, even if they are hidden.